Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Van Alstein. Welcome to setting up your personal academic website. My name is Jennifer. I'm talking today with my friends, uh, Brittany Trin, who makes websites for scientists, and Dr. Ian Lee from Owlstown, which is an academic website builder for you all to check out. We're gonna have a demo of that today, but we're also gonna talk about the most frequently asked questions when it comes to having your own personal website. Just to get us started, my name is Jennifer Van Alstein. I own the Academic Designer LLC, where since 2018, I've been helping professors have a strong online presence so they can talk about their research and teaching, really feel comfortable when they show up um, online. I, I help people with social media, bio writing, and websites. And I really love my work, but there's so many people out there who want to DIY, to do it yourself for your website. So I was excited to put this together put this event together with Brittany and Ian as part of our best annual academic websites contest. Brittany, would you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany. Um, I am a website strategist and designer for early career researchers, and I'm also a third year PhD student in chemistry at um, U University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, yeah, I've been doing this since 2019. And I just really love helping the grad students and early career scientists, um, even like anybody at any stage, like create their websites because I think it's really important for your personal like development and your career development as well. It's a great place to, you know, show off your skills a little bit more about yourself. Um, and I also have a podcast called Beyond Your Science. So you can check that out. I'm really excited to chat with y'all today. Ian, please introduce yourself and let us know about Allistown too. Sure, thanks Jennifer. Hi, I'm Ian and I'm the creator of Allistown. Um, I finished my PhD a long time ago, uh, about 10 years now, 10 years ago. And I remember being in grad school and working on my website and um, I thought it was a good way to share my work with others. And um, I thought that I, I could help others make uh, make their websites easier so they can share their their work easily and so about five years ago i started working on alstown as a as a hobby that uh, was and also a way for it to help um, other people um, build their website and so um alstown's mission has been to make it like super easy to to uh to make an academic website so i will demo that later and also, I'm looking forward to answering um, um, questions that people might have about how to share their, their research online and um, what, what things to share uh, about their academic work. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the biggest question that comes up from academics, kind of wherever, whatever stage they are in their career, is, is a website right for me? Like, should I have a website? Why should I have one? Um, so let me know, what do you guys think? Why should academics have a website? I guess I can answer that first. So um, so one reason is um, we're, um, we're in 2023 and um, people are gonna uh, look for your name on, on, on search engines. And so you want the, um, you want something that you control that will show up on those search engines. So if they want, they search for your name, you want it to be a way that um, probably a website that you have control over what content shows up. And a website is a great way to kind of um, uh, share what you want to share, like your papers, your posters, uh, an introduction about yourself and um, a lot more content about your research. Brittany, what about you? Why should early career researchers, why should people have a website? I think that early career researchers uh, are like, they should have a website because um, like, like Ian said, like people will search for you on search engines and things like that. Like having a LinkedIn is good and your CV is like, has a lot of things that you do, but it's not everything that you do. And there's a lot more sides to you that you can't necessarily fit in your LinkedIn or CV because it may not be like as um, 
relevant or something, um, but your website is like a way to kind of show off that creativity. And it's also possibly a way to maybe venture into like an entrepreneurial, like, like a side hustle or things like that, if that's something you're interested in, which is like what I did for myself um, prior to going to grad school and a little bit even right now too. And I think that like having the website opens you up to like so many more possibilities and opportunities for people to connect with you um, with your work and then maybe learn about like services or things like that if that's something you choose to offer but yeah I think it's just mostly like a space that you can create and like make your own and do whatever you want with it um, and also right now we're like really in like the like content creator like era I guess it's like a like a like making a personal brand and just like becoming known for something um, is also important, like showing people like not just what you do, but like what you really value, what you're passionate about. Um, that is something that you can also showcase on your personal website. I love that. You know, I think one thing that you both talked about is having control, having control over what people find about you when they search online, but also having control that they're finding the things that you value and care about, not the things that you know are standard in a CV or that you're gonna find necessarily on specifically your faculty profile. And actually, I really feel like having your own space, like a personal website, having your own space that's outside of your university, outside of your affiliation, makes such a lasting difference. I even have retired academics reach out to me because now that their faculty profile is just gone completely, they need somewhere to still share the hard work that they've done and the ways that they're helping people. So it's not like it's ever too early or too late to create a website for your research, your teaching, the service that you do and the things you care about. Uh, There's so many reasons to have a website, so many different ones that have surprised me, whether it's wanting to share your book, share your research, connect better with your students. I mean, it just There's so many options. I have a poll for you all, uh, for everyone who's in the audience. Let me run this. I wanna know how long have you wanted a website? Answer this poll. Let me know how long have you wanted a personal academic website? Is it something that's been on your to-do list for a while or is it something that's new? And maybe some of you are like, "Mm, I don't know if a website is right for me. That's why I'm here. That's okay too. All right, let's see. So for some of you, this has been on your to-do list for a long time. You've been wanting a personal academic website. And my guess is there's something that's been holding you back from making it. Feel free to let me know in the chat. Uh, You know, if that's you, why have you not had a website? You know, let me know in the chat. And if you've recently been inspired to want a website, I'm so glad you're here. I mean, this is the perfect event because we're going to help you make sure that you approach this project with kind of like a strategy, like a plan in mind and think about, you know, kind of your long term goal. So I'm excited. And a few of you already have a personal website. Let me know how long you've had your website for in the chat. Okay. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you both before we move on is a fear or anxiety that I've heard multiple times from a few people. Will my university get angry at me? Will they get mad if I make my own website? Do they not want me to do this? I have an answer based on like my interactions with university administration and with people who run social media and marketing for universities, but I want to hear from you both. What in your experience, have you, have you ever seen anyone get mad at someone for having a personal website? In my personal experience, I don't know about like university, um, but I do know from like working in industry, um, this wasn't directly related to my website but I wanted to do something like more in the online space and they I asked for permission which was not the way to go (laughs) should always ask for forgiveness Uh, but I would also say that I don't know if the university it would care they they just seem quite large unless you were like very prominent or something then maybe they would care but um I think Jennifer you might probably be like the most like have the most expertise in this area 
No, that's fine. I think that's a perfect example because sometimes if you have an employer or a partnership outside of the university, they do have a strong opinion about it. One of my clients, for instance, worked for the military and the military did not want her specifically to have a website. That's fine. We found other ways for her to have an online presence. But when it comes to your university, Mostly they want their professors to have a stronger online presence because you represent the university and the research that you do is awesome for the university. They want more people to know about it. They want more people to know about the awesome teaching you're doing and how you're affecting students. I mean, it makes a big difference for them in terms of revenue. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's definitely about marketing and money for them. But it's also about championing the resources that they give you, um, your lab, your uh, ability to do research on campus, the teaching that you do. If they give you innovative classes, they get really excited about that thing. I am not going to lie to you. They are looking at your website because they want to see how it helps them. <laughs> They're not going to look at your website to see how it makes them mad. Now, one caveat to that is if you have highly confidential information uh, that you're not allowed to share, uh, that's something that you might want to check with your university about. Uh, one example of that is uh, from a research lab. They had some specific equipment that their university didn't want them to list as being in their lab, just for security reasons. And so there may be some opportunities where you do want to ask permission. But other than that, I agree with Brittany. Like, Go ahead, make your website. And if someone has a problem, you know, they'll let you know and you can decide where to go from there. Ian, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so from my experience, um, um, I, had a, I had a website in undergrad and then in grad school, I went to a different school. So um, I also started a website there. I used initially the the this, the, the servers that were provided by the university. And then at some point I got my own domain name just so that in case I did move, I still have control over my own name. So, um, but yeah, but I think the, the university provides the space to share your work. So I think they, they want, they do want you to share your work online they provide the space to do that now whether you need to have whether it needs to be under the institution's name or your own domain name i think that's could be up to you in my case i wanted i was shifting institutions so i wanted to have my own space so that i don't have to move it and, and also like the spaces that i had at my undergrad and my grad school eventually disappeared so um it was good that i had my own uh uh domain name to kind of hold all that information. I love that. I feel like spaces disappearing is a key reason why some academics reach out to me. Uh, and I work with academics on really planning like strategically their website. Many are thinking about much more extensive websites than uh, the typical person is looking for. Uh, but it's always about like, what do I do? Like, how do I not make the wrong decision when I'm first getting started? And that's why I wanted to talk to you both about personal academic website hosts, because the first question people have when it comes to making their website is, where do I even host my website? And Ian, I know you've created a wonderful option with Owlstown, but there is a few different options that people can choose from. What are the options, Brittany? Yeah, so for me, I um, the two that I usually like to champion for people who are starting out would be one is Google Sites, which is free and it's available in your Google Drive account. So you can start making one there. Um, it's really good because like you can still have like some customizability, but everything is like pretty like drag and drop. So if you know how to use like PowerPoint or something, like you're good to go. You don't need to worry about coding or anything. And then the other one I like to recommend is just like the free wordpress.com. That's what I started out with when I was an undergrad because I wanted to blog. I think it's good for blogging and um, it's a good introduction to like what websites can do on a, um, but then of course, like once you, um, kind of want to level up then there are even more options um but maybe that's 
a little bit further down the line. So, but yeah, those are the two I, I would recommend. And of course, Alice Town too, but we'll see that later. <laughs> That's great. Yes, I love I love Google Sciences, especially a beginner option, but I like Alice Town for academics more, especially if you're looking for something simple because Alice Town already makes it easy for you to drop things into that are specific for academics. Uh, but when it comes to free sites, WordPress.com, I totally agree with. That's my number one pick for academics. Um, it's what I recommend for all of my clients. Now, some people like using Squarespace um, that has great features as well. I don't typically recommend Wix.com. I know Brittany and I have talked about this before on my podcast, The Social Academic. Um, Wix has issues. Many of my clients come to me with an old Wix website that is just practically impossible for them to update. Um, and I don't recommend it for those reasons. <laughs> what about you? Anything else that you don't recommend when it comes to making your own website? Uh, also in my personal experience, Weebly was not the greatest. It like works. And I know a lot of people have like made websites on Weebly, but I would say that if you haven't made one yet, maybe not to try it. Um, it's because uh, with Weebly, there's like a lot of functionality that's usually like extra, like you have to pay for it. But for on, on, on other websites, it's already included, which kind of bothers me on like, a, like on principle. So um, I don't recommend it for that reason. Great. Ian, do you have any website uh, hosts that you just don't recommend? Um, I don't know if I have ones that I don't recommend. I think the I think it'll depend on um, uh, on I guess your how much time you have and how much effort you want to put in. And um, I think some people choose to like make their own set up their own server and make their own website that way. Like I did that in undergrad. Like I I guess I didn't have to set up my own server, but I um, I made my own website, but I had too much time on my hands and in grad school i did set up my own server again i think i maybe had too much time so but i think the um i think it just depends on your how much time you have and like uh how much effort you want to put it into it and so i think there's outside of squarespace weebly wordpress some people choose to do like github pages um my own personal website i think is in github pages um, and so there's a lot of like free options like that. And, um, and I think that, um, um, I think the, when you're thinking about when making your website, you want, you want to think about, um, how much time you want to put into it, how much money, I guess. And, um, also, um, time, effort, money, and, on top of like what you want to share in your website. And so what I would recommend is focus on what you want to share rather than focusing on what would be the, the technology that you would use to like make the website. Because it, learning HTML, JavaScript and CSS can take up a lot of time. Uh, I know it, I do websites all the time, so I know how much time it takes, but <laughs> unless you're, you don't, you don't want to get your PhD in HTML and CSS, you want to, you're working on your PhD on whatever field you're in and you want to, to share to share that and and as much as possible um, spend the time on how you want to present your work and and focus on that. I completely agree with everything you said. Yeah, if you don't want to learn CSS, JavaScript, HTML, you don't want to learn how to code for your website, don't try and build it from scratch. Like it's it's not worth your time. Um, and honestly, it means that you have to go back and make changes and updates using that same method. Uh, and that can be okay now, but maybe you won't have that time in the future. Uh, when it comes to exactly what Ian was talking about, like time, effort, like what do you want to focus your energy on? I agree. Focusing your energy on what you say, why you're saying it, and who you're saying it to 
is what's going to make the difference for your personal academic website. And I think that's why Owl's Town is such a good solution. Now, I want to caveat and say that if you're going to have a blog, I really do recommend WordPress and WordPress.com is a great option. That's because blogging uh, has been done by them for so long. They're going to continue to have very focused blogging features. But Owl's Town, if you want a website and blogging is not guaranteed something you want to do this year, Let's talk about Owl's Town because this is an academic website builder that is meant to be easy so that you can focus on what you're saying and who you're saying it to and not on learning how to make your website. Ian, can you tell us about Owl's Town? Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I um, so Owl's Town compared to um, the other tools out there is only for for academics. And so the idea is that, um, it has uh, templates that are focused on academics. So you can post your publications, your projects that you work on, courses that you teach, people that you collaborate with, and um, some blogging features. And also you can um, post your CV and, um, and other pages that you might wanna add on top of like your publications and projects. And so um, as much as possible, Owl's Town tries to get out of the, the, the way of fiddling with the design and the HTML so that you can focus on uh, the content that you're sharing. Um, yeah, and I've been working on it um, for, for about five years now. And it's a, it's, a, it's a passion project. It's a passion project, and I really enjoy working on it. So, and I'm looking forward to sharing it. That's great. Well, you actually share your screen and give us a little demo of it now, because, you know, if you did bring your bio headshot and your social media links with you today, this is so fast to set up. You'll have time to do it while we're talking today. So Ian, why don't you show us a demo of Alice Town? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And for those of you who are listening, you know, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. We're going to have time for Q&A after our discussion. Close this. There you go. Okay, so we'll make a website. Uh, if this is Alstown here, and um, you can find it at alstown.com. And so first, I'm going to, we're just going to go through the create your free website here. And it's gonna welcome you with uh, a welcome page. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so first I'm gonna, uh, when I make this website, I'll put my own information, but you can put on, you can put on, uh, put in your own information in here. And as you can see, as I'm change, um, um, filling out the fields here, the website is changing. Um, I'll set up a, an image here, but for now, uh, I'll just set up a, a letter, which is I, so that we can go through this quickly. And thanks. Okay, so here I can just do a short bio. I won't spend too much time on this. This is I'm just gonna say hi. You can probably, when you're starting out, you can probably just do something quickly. And, but I think the note here is, this is the first thing that people will, this is the first page that people will see. So it might be good to kind of describe what you're working on and um, something more about yourself. Uh, next. And here, the, um, one of the things that also, when you're sharing your website, when you're creating a website is that you also have your social links. And so you might wanna share uh, several of your social links here. I have an example of my Twitter account, but you can share your ORCID, uh, um, uh, ORCID page, ResearchGate, uh, your Google Scholar, Scholar page. If you have Instagram or a YouTube channel, um, you can share it here also. 
So you can add those links. And I think there's more options here. For example, if you have academia.edu, uh, if you have a GitHub page and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the next one here is um, when you start creating an Nelson website, it randomly picks a, a theme. And in the, right now the theme it's using as flannel, but you can quickly switch. So one of the things about, um, I mentioned earlier about um, reducing the friction of fiddling with your website, with, with Alstown, changing a theme is just a click away. So like I click on a theme and then it changes immediately. I don't have to set up any HTML uh, or any CSS. And then um, I can pick a color. Uh, and uh, and I can also change a font. Again, it's just, uh, I'm just clicking through and picking which ones I like. So for now, I'll pick out, this is one of the fonts I like, Lotto. So, and then next, um, uh, the other thing that you can do is also add your publications. And it's just also another, just a click away. So I've typed in my name, I search for it. Um, and then among here, I believe, which one is me? I have to figure out which one is mine, but um, this one's mine right here. Um, I can, again, just click on my name and the, um, my publications are automatically included. And I'm done. In this case, I have a website with uh, some information about myself, an introduction and some publications. And then if I want to edit some more things, I can. I can. So for example, I can add descriptions of my projects, uh, people that I work with, courses that I teach and blog posts. Um, and then um, if, want, if I want to publish this website, I can create an account, then I can select the the domain name that it will be published in. I go. love it. That was so much easier than any other website creator that I've seen. And I love how tailored it is for academics. Even when you get to the end and you get to the site editor, it's giving you options that academics typically need, like adding collaborators. So that's wonderful. Let me ask this question because so many people feel like when they find a website host there's not really a customer service on the other end let's say you're creating an alistown website what do you what what can people do if they have like a question good question so um uh one of the things that people do is um they can contact me through um uh, twitter or email, and I try to respond quickly. And um, um, yeah, so usually people email me, and then most of the ideas that I for I'll feature ideas for features in Alstown came from suggestions from users. Uh, they email me, hey Ian, um, I would like this feature on Alstown, and um, if it fits with with um, the goals of Alstown, I usually try to add it. And um, also people call, contact me through Twitter also, just um, either post mentioning me or um, sending a DM. And I answer, I answer, I try to answer as quickly as possible. Usually um, there's a turn back to time of like within a day. I love how personalized that is. So many of my clients, you know, I have them uh, at wordpress.com and they upgrade to the point in which they get good customer service, but it doesn't always come with that free plan. One of my recent sales calls actually said she loves her small website host because of that personalized experience. When she emails, she actually gets a response. And that's the experience you're going to get with Ian over at Owlstown for academics. So that is excellent. I'm so glad I asked you about that. And thank you for giving us a demo. So if you want to set up your Owlstown website, now you know how. Uh, but based on our time, we're going to keep going and talking about questions. I have another poll for you. Let's open it up. 
launch. Okay, so we're going to talk about website page ideas. What pages do you want for your personal academic website? Look at this poll and let me know. Check all of the pages that you're kind of interested in having for your personal website. There's so many options and on Owlstown, you can do a lot of these pages and add your own. So there's a lot of flexibility to grow your website over time. But remember, you can start with just one page. I recommend it's the about page. Answer the poll, let me know. What pages are you interested in for your personal academic website? And if there's a page you don't see here, let us know in the chat. This was the only options, like the maximum number of options that Zoom let me add. <laughs> All right, looks like everyone has responded. Let me share the poll with you all. So yay, everyone definitely wants an about page. That is exciting. Research and teaching are super popular. Yeah, so many people want to share their writing and publications. That's great. One of the things that I like about Alistown is that you can add information to your publications. You can add an abstract and you can add more. Um, so don't think that just because it's just like letting you add those things in the list that you can't add and make that even more engaging with abstracts. Okay, people are also interested in sharing speaking engagements and maybe some news and media mentions. Definitely contact. I love it. I love it. This is great. Brittany and Ian, where should people start when it comes to like, what pages should I add to my personal academic website? What would you say is like most important? What should people prioritize? I have a, I have a particular opinion about this one. So um, I think my opinion here is that I think it's um, having a description of your projects. So not necessarily public year, publications, but the projects that you're working on. I think this, this um, I'm pushing on this because sometimes um, people hesitate to have a website because um, they don't have a publication yet. Um, when I was in grad school, I didn't publish until my fifth year. So it took a long time. So, but the ideas that I was working on started in my first year. So um, I think it um being able to like share those ideas and the, the stuff that I was working on, I think um, was it was good, and um, and it, it led up to uh, to getting published at some point. Uh, but but I was able to collaborate with 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 people um, even before I was was published because I was sharing my ideas on on a website, um, and so I would say. You have a website, you introduce yourself and then have descriptions of your projects. Um, that, and within those um, disc project descriptions, you can add posters that you've shared where you've shared um, those projects. Uh, and then eventually if it gets published, then you can add publications on those project descriptions. But it's, it's okay to start out with just the description of the projects or ideas and then share that. Brittany, what about you? Where should people start when it comes to like what to prioritize for my personal academic website? I think actually Ian said it like perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, because it and and also if you have anything that's like outside of your research as well that you're very passionate about, like some type of cause, like a lot of people in the research or at least in the science. Um, you know, there's like SciComm, science policy advocacy, like all those types of things, outreach, like any of those things that you do, especially if you're particularly passionate about it, if you can like feature that in some way, like on your website, um, if you already have like photos on hand or like just like write like a story about yourself, you know, like kind of so to like Ian's point, like when you write your description about yourself, like kind of root it in like the why you're doing this, like the why you're interested in research or all like the things that you're doing. Um, that's, I think, really important in terms of like creating that personal connection with somebody in the online space. Um, so then people, again, can get to know you beyond just like whatever they can read, like in your CV or your LinkedIn or whatever. I love that. So 
why you're doing what you're doing is so important for helping people to connect with what you care about and the work that you're doing. Now, when it comes to your personal academic website, making sure that why is in your bio and also in your project descriptions is great. Actually, if you only have one sentence for your bio and one sentence for each project description, it should probably be about why you're doing it. Now, when it comes to helping people find your research on your website, make sure that you're actually using the words that people are going to Google. Um, so if you have specific, you know, phrase that that, you know, that is related to your research, I can't even think of one now. Um, let's see for for my recent my recent client, uh, she's looking at specifically immigration in the United States. So she needs that specific phrase to be on her website so more people can find her research about that specific topic. So make sure you're being descriptive in how you're talking about your research as well. So include the why and include the words that people will actually use to search for your research topic. That would be my top suggestions for getting up your website. Now, let me ask, what about a website photo? Like, do I need like a photo of my face on my website? That is a frequent question I get. What would you say? I personally think that you should have at least just like one photo. Like if it's just like a selfie, it doesn't have to be fancy. Something that like, again, kind of like showcases who you are a little bit. Um, and also I think for a lot of universities, you do also upload like a photo for your department anyway. I don't, um, but I think that also helps with the, the personal connection and such. Yeah, and I really liked how Alistown gave you different options. So if you're first getting, just getting started, you can have like your letter instead of a profile photo. What do you think? Do you need a profile photo on your website? Yeah, so yeah, so Alistown gives you that option, but most people actually just put up their, their own photos. So um, I think it, it is helpful to have your photo on there because eventually uh, if they are interested in your work, in your research, you're going to meet them eventually. The people who visit your website will meet them. You'll, you will meet them eventually. So it's in conferences, um, in talks that you do. Um, when I was in grad school, uh, um, people have mentioned things that were on my website and that was kind of like a, a way to like start conversations. And so uh, it's probably good to, for them to associate my face with uh, the content of the, of the, the, the website so that when we do see each other at the univer at universities or at conferences, um, they know to associate it with my face. I completely agree. I think having a photo of yourself is super helpful. If you really are uncomfortable with it, having some kind of avatar, you know, a little cartoon version of yourself is a great alternative. You could also use um, a different kind of graphic or an avatar um, that is specifically representative of your research. Uh, so like a little icon or something I have seen people use. But overall, I just think a photo of your face can make a really big difference. And if you record a short video for your website, that goes such a long way to helping people really recognize you as a human being, as a person, and for remembering your research. So uh, even if you don't, you're like, ah, I can't write a lot for my website, I don't have a lot of time now, but I can hop on Zoom and record like a one minute, hi, my name is video, that could make a really big difference too. Now, when it comes to getting started with your personal academic website, where should people start? Ian, Brittany, let me know what you think. Brittany, why don't you go first? Where should people start? What's their first step? Like the, like physically, where should they start or? Like everyone here probably either has a website already or they are looking to actually make their website. Mm -hmm. And Owlstown is a great solution. Now we know how to make it. Like we know how to use that, but like, what about people who are going to use, you know, Google sites or mm. WordPress.com? Where should they start when it comes to their website? Is it their domain name? Like, yeah, I would say like, be besides like the technical things, um, I think the most important thing is, I think we kind of touched on this earlier, is like making sure you're like very clear about like your goals for your website. Like, what are you trying to do and how much time you want to put into it so then that way you don't feel like you know um that it's 
you know, something that you didn't finish or whatever, like just say like, okay, I just want to get my website up because of X, Y, Z reasons. And for this time period, right? Like, okay, if it's just like a one pager website, that's fine, you know, um, that's better than nothing. And so I think like being able to clarify your reason for creating your website at this point in time um, will help you kind of feel less like, I guess the word is like mind drama about whether or not you quote unquote finish it or not finish it. Um, so yeah. And then of course, like choose your website builder, definitely get a domain name, uh, get it in your name. Um, because I like a lot of the website builders, like usually um, if you use a free plan, you, um, you are like, uh, technically a subdomain so you're like under like their website name um but a domain name is a domain name is quite inexpensive like on google domains i i just like google domains because it's like simple um yeah like that your name.wordpress.com which is okay too um but personally i really just want my name and so uh i have also like multiple domain names just in case of other things in the future but yeah you can just go on google domains and like buy one for like twelve dollars a year or something like that um so it's like a pretty nice investment and then um yeah it's it's pretty simple it's just like buying anything else on the internet you add it to cart and then um there are some technical things that you have to figure out but you just like basically just just follow directions on like an faq page or a help guide or something like that Ian, can you set up your own domain name on Owlstown? Yeah, you can You can add your own domain name on Owlstown. Um, Owlstown is free for the, what you mentioned, like the subdomain, but the uh, the if you want your own custom domain, then you have to get a paid plan. But um, to um, Brittany's point about how where to start, I think having like a, a one pager, I think is, is a good way to start. I think sometimes people think that they have to have a, a, a complete website with multiple pages to feel like they've they have a website with just one page i think you already have a website if you have information about you can think of when you start you can think of your website as a way to kind of uh, as a central place to put to direct your to your your or a central place to put your your um all your online content so if you have like uh, an introduction about yourself, uh, your contact info, like your email, if I, a way to contact you, because people are going to try to contact you about your work. And then maybe if you have links to like uh, where your publications are listed on Google Scholar, on Academia, on EDU, on ResearchGate, if you just have links to those, that's that's sufficient. And um, and like the the your academic website can be can act as a like a hub for people who are interested in your work to kind of get connected to other things um, that um, might give more information about your work. Asha asked a question, perfect timing, so we can get to all of your questions. Please, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, you'll also be able to unmute yourself and talk with us. But Asha's question is, should we add our middle initial to our domain name? That's a great question. Ian, what do you think? Yeah, I don't think so. that's a problem. I think it's a, a one way to kind of uh, differentiate yourself if your name is common. So um, for my name, I have two middle names. I was able to get ianlee.com, um, but I think if I were to get ianlee.com, then I won't be able to get it. So I could probably use um, my middle name, my middle names, to, my middle initials onto to my domain name and i think that's uh that's probably going to be one way that people are going to be looking for me also so um ian ar lee is one way to look for me and so if that's on my domain name then then they can find me Brittany, what about you what do you think adding your middle initial to your domain name i would say that uh so i was also lucky like ian i have brittanytrend.com but i think it also it again there's a lot of things that play into it. It's like, one, do you want your middle initial in there? Two, do people know you by your middle initial? Like I recently found out that I should include my middle initial when I published like academic papers. I didn't realize that before. Um, and just again, to differentiate myself. And then the other thing is like, is it available, right? So you might also come to find out that like, okay, 
uh, you can use your name and your middle initial and the URL is still not available, which is why I think it's really important to get your domain name as soon as possible. So if there's nothing else you do today, look up your domain name. That's great. One thing I would add to that is that if you have been publishing for a long time and you haven't used your middle initial, adding it in now is fine, but you'll probably want to switch uh, to publishing with your middle initial from now on. Your website is going to be the hub where all of that comes together, but when it comes to how people search and how people look for things, honestly, copy paste, type in exactly what they see or what they're looking for to expect. If they type in your name without the middle initial and way too many people come up and it's hard to find you, that's when you want to add it. That's when you that's when you want to add it. And if you don't have a middle name, which is true for so many people, if you don't have a middle name, that's okay. A lot of my clients will add like one word or a short phrase that like represents their research uh, to the end of their name. And that's an easy way to differentiate yourself. Some people will also add their title like doctor uh, to the front of their name to differentiate themselves. So there are options. You don't have to go with your middle initial just because you think that's you know what other people are looking for. If you just wanna go with your name without the middle initial because that's how you feel, that's how you're presenting yourself, that's how you publish and how you wanna share your work with the world, go ahead and do that. Um, don't feel like you need to add it uh, unless it becomes problematic for you in the future. But you know, when you build an online presence, things like that happen less and less because people are already able to find your website when they search for your name. All right, next question. Would a website still be okay if transitioning away from academia, but not industry for a chemist? Is a website still okay if you might be transitioning away from academia? I, I would say yes, definitely. Uh, what about you two? I think I just wanted to clarify. So by like not industry, do you mean like, like you're not working in industry, but you're doing something else? I mean, in general, I think having a website is fine. I was just curious because <laughs> I mean, I had my website. I started technically officially started my business and real website while I was working in industry. So I guess, I guess it also depends on what, what you mean by okay. Oh, you will not, will not be working in industry. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's, I feel like there's nothing to lose with like having a website except maybe like, like a couple, like 20 bucks or well, how much ever it costs to like host a website, depending on whatever you get. Um, yeah, I think it's like I mentioned earlier, it's like your creative space. You can use it for like whatever you want. So if you want to use it as like a portfolio of, of sorts, like for again, your projects and to get a career in a different field or something that's also like a really good place to showcase some of that um, more in depth as well. I've also created a, a website for someone who was leaving academia and they were not going back into the workforce. Um, they weren't at like retirement age, but they just weren't going back to, they were taking an extended time away from working and they still wanted a website because their work was still important to them. They still wanted readers for their book. They really wanted to keep in touch with their past students and they still wanted to be part of the community, even though they weren't going to be actively working or receiving employment from a university. Um, and that made a really big difference in their lives and how connected they felt. So if you are feeling like you want a website, no matter what you're doing after academia, or if you're staying in academia, but switching what you're doing, say you're moving into a leadership position, it's all okay. And the best part is exactly what Brittany said, which is that your website can adapt with you over time. It can be your creative space and it can also be your professional space to showcase what you want, when you want it. And you can even get rid of those pages if they no longer align with your needs. Ian, what about you? Yes, yeah, so I have been out of academia for 10 years now and I still have uh, my website up because um, people still cite the publications I had from grad school, so, and I, I make the, the PDFs available on my website. So uh, if people are looking for, for example, if it's cited and they're looking for uh, the paper, they can find it on my website. Um, also my dissertations there, uh, if they wanna see it. Um, my, I also have some talks 
posters. And so it's a great way for people who are who are finding my name on 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 citations and that they can um, they have a way to kind of still see um, different um, different content related to that work. I love that. So it's definitely been something all of us have experienced both in academia and outside of academia. And our website has been helpful to each of us personally during that time. We definitely think it will be helpful for you as well. We would love to answer your questions. So let us know what questions do you have about personal academic websites? We're happy to answer all your questions. I have a question for you too. How should people know when they should hire help, like when they don't want to DIY their website? Um, since I am a website designer and I have done this for a couple of clients, I would say usually it's it's like a time issue. It's just like if you are just very busy. So like the people who have normally hired me are like, um, I've actually had some more like mid-career professors hire me too, um, which is really funny, I think. But yeah, they they just have like everything else is just higher priority than their website. It's like they have to teach their classes, run their research group, um, write a textbook, like they running their own business, like everything else is higher priority and they just need to delegate. I think that's just something that's like a personal call you need to make. Like when can you delegate? When can you like do it yourself. Um, and I think the other important thing also is like making sure that whoever you choose to work with, if you choose to work with somebody that they also like show you how it works and stuff. Um, uh, and they, or like they've set it up for you in a way that is like easy for you to manage, especially if you don't have like a lot of time on your hands to, to do that later on, either that or, you know, if, if you have the, um, the, the funds available to just like have someone like manage it. Um, I think that's like the important thing. Yeah, it's just like how how important like and how much time you put into this. Yeah, and everyone on Alstown is doing it themselves. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So with Alstown, it's all DIY. DIY in that um, you're adding the content yourself. And um, yeah, so any help is if people are asking for help from me, it's mostly the features of the website rather than the how the, the content is being added to the website. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. I, I really find that when academics come to me, they're exactly kind of the same as Brittany. Like they don't have the time or energy to make their own website. And they know that whatever amount of time it's going to take, it's just more than they can afford. Not just in terms of their personal life and their research, but in terms of their attention and like what they want to focus on. Like it makes a big difference if you can be writing your book or, you know, working on your dissertation, like focusing on the things that you need to be doing instead of your personal website. Now, Alistown makes it really easy. If you have the content, you can just drop it in and have your website published so fast. I just love that as an option. And if you're like, I want a really extensive website, but I don't have time for it this year, go to Alistown because maybe it's going to meet all of your needs. But when it comes to hiring help, it's okay to hire help if you feel like you want support, if you know that having support is gonna make your life easier. And it's okay to go out and reach out to people and ask questions to see if they're gonna be a good fit to work with you. A lot of professors find working with someone locally, a local website developer works well for them because they already know what they want on their website. But when it comes to your website, don't let the what should I put on it hold you back from publishing a one page website. We were talking about that earlier, but like it is so important that you know, you don't need a perfect website. It doesn't need to be exactly the way you thought of it in your head to hit publish. Launching it now is great. And it also means you can enter our best personal academic websites contest. This is our second year running the contest where we're giving away multiple awards for the best personal academic websites. We are definitely giving an award in the Alstown category. So if you do decide to build your website with Alstown, we hope that you'll submit. But we also give an award for one page personal academic websites. So if you can create your website before was it September 10th, I think, when the deadline closes, we would love for you to submit to our contest. 
Okay, if you have questions about personal academic websites, be sure to drop them in the chat or raise your hand and you can unmute yourself. Brittany, Ian, is there anything we haven't talked about that you feel like we should definitely talk about? I guess like the other part of having a website is like once you make it, you got to share it with people. So you got to put it um, like on your LinkedIn or uh, something. I know that like on Google Scholar, you can also link like a website on there. Um, so that might be uh, helpful. Um, yeah, you, you got to start like putting it on things um, so people can find it. I mean, in beyond just like Google search. Yeah, on your like social media profiles too. I just throw it on there. Yeah, that's great. Also in your email signature and on your faculty profile, those are pretty easy updates for how to share your website. Also in your bio, if you're presenting at conferences, adding your website to your bio, is going to help all those people attending your talk and the people who can't attend your talk find you and your work. Ian, what about you? Is there, any oh, we had another question. How often should we be updating our websites? How often should you update a website? So, yeah, so if, I think if you have new information that you can add to your website, I think uh, you can add it then. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, uh, it, I, don't, I wouldn't say that it has to be like weekly or monthly. As long as you have new information, uh, you can add it in. I think the important thing is that the information on your website is up to date. I think the, I think I'm of the opinion that the worst website are the ones that are, are not updated. So if you go on there, you think that they last published five years ago, but really they had something published like a year ago. You know, so people are looking for information on your website. You want it to be up to date. Now, whether you need to update it, updated weekly with new information. I don't think you have to. I think it's as long as it's uh, updated with the with the information that you um, that you want them to to know. Uh, so yeah, so I think the so if I'm going to rank the importance of like whether the how the website looks, what it, or the the how uh, how updated the website is, I think the how updated the website is, the, I think it's more important. Because you, I think too many, too. I think I've, I've had too much experience going to a website, an academic website, and finding like really old information, and um, it just becomes a, a, a problem when you're looking for like, um, research or collaborators and things like that. I like that. You know, I, I typically with my clients, I tell them that updating your website can be a nice kind of celebration every time you're going to add a line to your CV or something, you know, add it to your website too, because it's actually going to help people when it's on your website, people will actually be able to learn about it. Whereas with your CV, not a lot of people are going to be reading it on a regular basis. Your website is going to show up when they are Googling your name. So it does make a difference, but on a minimum, I typically recommend annually. So like if you are so busy and you're like, I know I'm not going to have time to update my website. I like, yeah, I have publications, but I don't have time to add them. Add into your calendar now to update your website in a year. And that reminder will be really helpful to make sure you actually get that done. Because so many of my clients have come to me like six, seven years after making their website and they haven't updated it since then. So it's typical, it's normal, it happens all the time, but we don't want that to happen to you. So that's why we're suggesting updating it more often. Let's see, next question is, can we add book reviews? Even though I'm in theology, I enjoy productive books. Yes, definitely. You can add book reviews. You can add any kind of writing that you want. Book reviews may be uh, a good thing to add to a blog, something where you're regularly updating it and you can add links to it. You can help share it. Um, people can even subscribe to them to get more of your book reviews. You could also just publish it as a page um, and continue, continually update it and add as you have new ones. So definitely add book reviews. Uh, next question is, do we still add when the page was last updated in the footer or no? Um, typically not, unless it is relevant to the, the information that you're sharing. So, for example, I have a blog post about the, the like, different social media platforms academics typically consider for themselves. And at the very bottom of the page, I write 
that you know this this has been recently updated on this date um and that the information is coming mostly from the specific like websites themselves of the social media platforms uh, i want to keep that updated because it's actually important for my readers to know when i've updated that but if it's not important for your readers to know when you updated a page it's probably information that they don't need that's what i would say all right we are a little bit over time but if you have any other questions we would love to answer them Brittany, ian is there anything i haven't covered that we should definitely chat about i think just to like add on to what we were talking about with updating websites i also think another good time to update your website is when you decide that whatever's on your website is not what you want on there anymore because your goals have changed or like your intention for your website has changed um so when that time comes like you can uh change out whatever you need to change out so like i think earlier like you know was saying like you know you want to showcase your projects um but also like it, i'm also of the opinion of that like you want to showcase this type of so let's say like you're a right a science writer and you have like a portfolio of sorts i would want to like update or like feature the type of science writing that you want to do in the future that you like currently have that you want to do more of rather than like let's say like a blog post that you wrote like years ago or something like that because that's something like one of my clients had an issue with she was like what do I do with all these blog posts that I've written or like for like external like contributions or whatever and I was just like well is this the type of writing you want to do like continue and she was like no I was like well then this doesn't necessarily need to be like um like front and center but instead let's like focus on the things like that you really want to highlight so that's like something to keep in mind when you're um, updating your website. That's great. That's so important. Yes. Thinking about what your goals are and if your website is going to meet them before you do the updates, you know, save yourself the time and think about what your, what your goals are. That's great. Ian, anything else we should cover that I haven't chatted about? Yeah, the, um, I think the to uh, I'd like to add to why the um, we might want to add links to our website from like social media. Um, I think that helps with discovery of um, of your website. So one thing we noted earlier was that people would look for you in search engines, but people will probably encounter your name from um, from Twitter or they looked at Google Scholar or um, other web other websites. So if they find your name and they have a link to your to your website, that's a good way to kind of um, introduce them to your other work. So for example, in Google Scholar, you can add a, a link to your homepage. Uh, Twitter is the same way. Um, um, yeah, so adding, adding and um, um, Jennifer mentioned this earlier, uh, putting your website on their email signature. It's also helpful where they, they see your email and they're like, oh, there's a link to a homepage. I'd like to find out more. I love that. Well, thank you all so much for coming to setting up your personal academic website. Uh, I'm Jennifer Van Alstein. I've been talking with Brittany Trin and Dr. Ian Lee, creator of Owlstown. We've had a lot of fun talking with you about websites and we wish you so much luck making your own website. We hope that when you do, you enter in our best personal academic websites contest. I do wanna share with you this resource. Um, it is at the bottom of this page. If you scroll, there are going to be so many different articles, interviews, resources from the three of us to help you set up your personal academic website. So we do wish you the best of luck with this project and hope to see you again at our next event. Bye.